welcome to Louisiana Lefty, a podcast about politics and community in Louisiana, where we make the case that the health of the state requires a strong progressive movement fueled by the critical work of organizing on the ground. Our goal is to democratize information, demystify party politics, and empower you to join the mission because victory for Louisiana requires you. I'm your host, Linda Woolard. On this episode, I speak with Dustin Granger, who's running for state treasurer on the October 14 gubernatorial primary ballot with the runoff scheduled for November 18, 2023. Louisiana Lefty doesn't tend to do episodes with candidates and we don't endorse, but there's a lot of long-term lessons to learn from Dustin's story. And he's the only Democrat running in this treasurer's race. In his campaign, Dustin's been making the case that Democrats need to highlight our party's record on the economy and push the progressive issues that poll so well, even in Louisiana, when focus on partisanship is removed from the message. But I'll let him tell it. Dustin Granger, thank you so much for joining me on Louisiana Lefty. Thank you for having me, Linda. I'm so excited to be here. I've uh, loved what you've done with uh, Louisiana Lefty. I've listened to most of the episodes uh, over the last year or so, and uh, thank you for having me. Oh, well, I really appreciate your joining us. I appreciate those kind words also, but I know you're very busy these days because you're running (laughs) a campaign, a statewide campaign, which is huge. Yes. But let's start with how you and I know each other. And I think it's just through democratic circles, but I feel like the first time we met in person was at the governor's mansion for a fundraiser, a charitable fundraiser. Is that? That's right. I think it was. Uh, I think we've uh, followed each other on social for a while, but then, yeah, we, we ran into each other and we had to get that picture and that's right. uh, right. Yeah, that was exciting. And that's the first ladies fundraiser that she does every year for her trio of great causes, which I won't try to recite here, but folks can go look up the Louisiana First Foundation if they're interested in what the First Lady's working on. But it's a great fundraiser she does every year. But Mm -hmm. let me ask you about you, Dustin. What's your political (laughs) origin story? What prompted you to first become interested in politics? Yeah, Linda, I grew up, you know, in a very conservative household. Um, I remember growing up uh, my father was listening to Rush Limbaugh on the radio. He had all the Rush Limbaugh books. And, you know, in the 90s, when I was in like high school and everything, just it, what politics just wasn't really talked about much. It was just just wasn't. And I just thought I was a Republican. I remember just because I thought everybody was. And I remember in 1998, it was like my senior year in uh, high school. And I was debating with some friends like politics came up. And I was debating the Republican side, and I re- quickly realized that I did not agree with what I was saying. And that led me on a path, you know, through college and a lot of the classes I had. I, you know, I became a Democrat in college, and, um, uh, you know, especially through the Bush years, and then 9 11 happened. And I would say I was to the point where I was like what I hear a lot of people say today. People say, well, I'm liberal on social issues, and I'm fiscally conservative, you know, and I was kind of one of those guys uh, because I was in business school. And even whenever I started my job as a financial advisor in 2004, I was still there, you know, because I you know, believed in capitalism and stuff. And then I think the turning point for me was 2008, 2009 financial crisis, because here I was, you know, a young guy, uh, a financial advisor, helping people that are 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s with their fi- their life savings. And then something happens that really nobody knew was going to happen. Nobody thought could ever happen. And I remember thinking, you know, everything I thought I knew about economics says that this can't happen. So I, and it was shocking to me. It was, it was you know, it really affected me at that age, especially. And I just went on a deep dive and passed, uh, you know, depressions and recessions and uh, throughout our history. And I realized a lot of them are kind of caused by the same thing. A lot of it has to do with, you know, too, too much uh, wealth accumulation at the very top and not for anybody else. And, you know, that wealth accumulation kind of creates a vicious cycle of power that, uh, kind of grows without end. And, 
Uh, that's when I became like a full blood Democrat. I knew I wanted to get into office then. Uh, then I, you know, I, but I thought, hey, it must be decades away. I'm in my 20s. I can't can't run. And, you know, when you're 25, you know, that's you can't do anything like that. Uh, so after 2015, 2016, I realized that, you know, a lot of things are happening. I'm not happy with uh, the people that are leading the state and this country and that I need to get involved soon. So that kind of started my path and in networking with local people in politics and then around the state. And then I would say after the insurrection happened, that's whenever I said, okay, I've been waiting long enough. It's time to go. So uh, ever since then, I've been, I feel like I've been running for three years in different ways. How old are you now, Dustin? I'm 43 now. Okay. Okay. Well, and you still, I still consider you young. And I think it's young people that really do have to step up now. I've been seeing the polling on the beliefs of young people, the national polling, and both Republicans and Democrats, younger voters, are just smarter than folks <laughs> of the older yes. generations right now. They're not yes. as focused on the culture war stuff. They're really focused on the bread and butter issues that, uh, you know, protecting the most vulnerable, yes, they care about that. They they care about people having their rights preserved and they care about these bread and butter issues like making sure that we have an economy that works for everyone. And that literally mm -hmm. is both sides of the aisle that we're hearing that from. So I'm mm -hmm. grateful that you stepped up to run and it really takes a lot more young folks like you to do that. Yeah, and I consider myself like an exennial, you know, I'm a straddle, you know, depending on, you know, I'm 1980. So some some people say it's millennial, most say it's gener generation X. So I kind of feel like I straddle both generations because when I was in school, things were pretty still segregated as far as like black and white friendships. It wasn't until my later years in high school where uh, I feel like it became more integrated. Now I look at the younger people and everybody's so integrated and mm -hmm. it's very inspiring. So Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like it's up to me to have an obligation to stand up and try to lead our our younger generations because I'm so proud of them. <laughs> and let's talk about your bio a little bit. You're married and you have two kids. Is that right? I have two little girls age eight and five. OK. And so you <laughs> also are doing what you're doing because you care about the Louisiana that they will inherit, of course. Yes, that's another thing that I think that, you know, that coincided with the. Uh, you know, 2016, and uh, that my, I had my first girl, girl then, and then just everything that has happened since, and that just made me suit up and and get going because I have two little girls to fight for. I have more skin in the game than I did before, for sure. And you mentioned what's your what's your day job been for the last several years? Yeah, for 20 years, I've been a financial advisor and a certified financial planner. So I help people invest their money, save their money, plan for their future. And certified financial planner is kind of not just investing and retirement planning, but it's also like insurance and taxes, how all of those things, all those pieces of the puzzle fit together for people. So you really have some of the experience a treasurer would need. Yes. And I've been through tough times, you know, helping you know, helping working people through the financial crisis. And, and then that prepared me for COVID and, and three major hurricanes that destroyed Lake Charles and the insurance issues. So I, I have uh, like the down and dirty experience of trying to get through crises. And you said you've been running for three years. What were the other offices that you've run for recently? Yeah. So after the insurrection, that's, uh, what Clay Higgins tweeted, like the end of U.S. as we know it is if Biden becomes president, I said, I want to challenge him. So but that he had just won election reelection. So it would have been a two year long race. Uh, so I, I started to run for that, started telling friends and stuff and started traveling around the third congressional district, set up a co campaign finance thing with the uh, with the federal uh, side. And then a seat came open, a state Senate seat locally, uh, Senate District 27, Ronnie John's old seat. And uh, some people in the party knew they needed somebody to run for that because it was about to go unopposed in that special election. And, you know, I, I decided, look, I was ready to go at that time. I didn't want to wait two years. I was ready to, to do an election. And I went for it. And it was just the best experience. And even though we came up short, we had some big wins there. 
And you know, I took a year off last year, but it was I didn't feel like I took the year off. I never felt like I fully left campaign mode because I knew I wanted to run for treasurer this year. Uh, so it really hasn't stopped for three years. <laughs> well, I think it's what you bring up is an important point. We have to have, and by the way, again, thank you for stepping up and running so that that person didn't go into office unopposed. We can't let that happen. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that you did that. But every time you run for one of these seats, I don't mean you personally, but every time a candidate runs for a seat, even if they lose, there's information you get, there's experience you get running. Obviously, you can't just run forever and lose every election, but, uh, right. but you know, I mean, it's rare for someone to run one election and win their very first election. That's such a oh, rare that was, it was It was priceless what I learned and, and it's prepared me so much for this one. I learned so much of what not to do, <laughs> how politics is. But we, you know, even though we came up short, you know, we for a special election in a lot of the uh, African-American districts, it was the highest turnout we ever had for a special election. So we built the excitement. And I'm proud of the fact that I won Lake Charles 60 percent. You know, we have a pretty gerrymandered district. Uh, this should be a more competitive district. But, uh, you know, Lake Charles won 60 percent. So I'm happy about that. And why treasurer, Dustin? Is it just because of your background or were there other reasons that made you want to run for treasurer? I think uh, both. Uh, I knew that this was something that I'm qualified for, like the, the roles of the treasurer almost match up exactly with what I do uh, for people, except on a larger uh, degree. And I think that economics is like at the center of my politics, I would say, because I would go as far as to say even a lot of the culture war issues are because of economic issues. I, I feel like politics is essentially uh, comes down to money and power and how to influence that. So I feel like, you know, you fix the economy. It fixes a lot of other things. And Democrats, it's our biggest uh, advantage that I don't feel like we use either. And I could talk more about that, too. But. I, I just wanted the chance to get around the state and and talk economics with people because I, I don't feel like enough Democrats do that. I think that's right. That's well, I know you've been on this kick on social media trying to let folks know what the treasurer does. So mm -hmm. what's that? What's the story there? Right. So the treasurer does three things, essentially. Two of the things are to do with Louisiana's ba balance sheet. Uh, when you so when I say balance sheet, you know you have the assets on one side and liabilities on the other. So what they do is the treasurer manages the assets. So there's billions of dollars of funds uh, of appropriations and things that the treasurer does. A lot of short term stuff. Uh, also the major pensions of the state, the state workers, their pensions. Uh, the treasurer manages that. And then on the other side of the balance sheet, uh, they're the chair of the bond commission. So. Any of the loans made through the state. So a lot of municipalities need to raise money for waterworks or, you know, downtown redevelopment or stadiums or really anything. Uh, they help set the agenda for the bond commission. Uh, so that's kind of like the direct things that they do. But I would say one of the most important roles is they are the advisor to our state government. It says in the, in the uh, Constitution that they advise the governor and the legislature on economic uh, policy and the economic state of the state. And they work for you. They don't work for them. The treasurer works for the people of the state, watches over the finances, and makes sure it's being used correctly for the people. So it's like the voice of the people advising the government. And that's what something I think was underutilized uh, in the past. I think John Kennedy kind of did that in a way it can be a bully pulpit to hold our government accountable. Uh, so I intend to use it that way. And it could be pretty powerful. So John Bell Edwards famously expanded Medicaid as his first act taking office as governor. What would be the first thing you'd want to do as treasurer? Yeah, so there's, uh, I would say, first of all, uh, there has been some political bans that our current treasurer has instated. Bans on clean energy investing was something he did with our investments. Uh, he also, along with other members of the Bond Commission, banned certain banks because of their business practices. Some of them don't want to do loans with gun manufacturers. 
So they've kind of taken the culture war issues and inserted it in our finances. And those basically are taking money out of people's pockets. You know, whenever you take out whole industries as a choice of investing, uh, that could lose us money. You know, diversification is investing 101. And on the uh, bond commission side, if we most of the banks have certain business practices like that. And I think what they quickly found out is those bans, then we didn't have any banks to underwrite our bonds and it gets way more expensive. There's a study that shows in Louisiana that it could cost us 50 to $150 million. And that goes directly to the people and the municipalities trying to raise money. So I would lift that immediately. And I'll also, you know, we have a billion dollars in unclaimed property. The treasurer also oversees that. I didn't mention that earlier. And that's at an average of $900 per person. I think the treasurer needs to be more proactive with getting that money out the door. And lastly, I want to establish a, uh, a small towns commission uh, in the treasurer's office to help our small towns get access to financing. We, a lot of our small towns around the state have uh, really been hurt by our brain drain. They've lost a lot of people. You can see their downtowns have shuttered up and they've lost a lot of staff too. And sometimes trying to get financing to help fix their wastewater issues or their drinking water issues can be cumbersome and tedious. And I think we need a team of people to help them with that proactively because they don't have the, the resources and they need to be able to, to rebuild their hometowns and attract and keep people. Those are really powerful things to start a term with. Thank you. I was interested that your campaign announcement, you did focus on that climate issue. Yes. You really highlighted that. What made you decide to do that? You know, I knew that we, uh, you know, it's to run as a Democrat statewide in Louisiana, when people think that uh, you don't have a chance, you need to take bold steps and talk about some of the things that you're not allowed to talk about, you know, never... Uh, we don't talk about Bruno, <laughs> you know, never talk about Bruno, like in the uh, in the song, in the Disney movie. Yeah, there's just some things that you're just not supposed to say. And I, I realize that, you know, if we're going to really tackle the issues and the problems in Louisiana, you know, we need to acknowledge the elephant in the room. Uh, Louisiana is the most affected and will continue to be the most affected state from climate change. Uh, we're also a state that has the identity or the political identity that people feel that we are a fossil fuel state. Mm -hmm. uh, not that it's true, but a lot of people just feel that way and they're scared to get past that. And so I wanted to hit, and I think a lot of that leads to a lot of the corporate lobby control that we have in the state uh, that feeds that lobby control in a lot of the other issues. I feel like most of our uh, elected leaders don't even say the word climate change. Uh, um, and so I wanted to lead with that. I wanted to, you know, rip the Band-Aid off. And look, I, when I, before I ran for this, I've, I've studied uh, polls going back for a long time. I even watched some old LPB videos from the early 2000s where they had roundtables on the same thing about climate change and our role with, with fossil fuel industry and uh, renewables 20 years ago. And you had there, they had some environmentalists, they have some representatives from the oil and gas industry, but they also had a lot of like regular people from towns around Louisiana, all in this like 12 person round table. And they had a small audience too, that was asking questions. And this was on people's minds back then. People were worried about losing out on something if we just stay tied to just one industry. And I feel like, uh, you know, I've never been a big environmentalist kind of guy, but I feel like it's something that we have to acknowledge and get past as a state and diversify our economy. And does the treasurer impact the climate issue more in more ways than just the lifting bans on investing? Yes, actually. And um, I noticed that some climate, or climate organizations focus on state treasurers because, again, it's the uh, the power of the balance sheet, you know. Um, a lot of our uh, climate action and protection from climate, uh, you know, flood protection, um, coastline protection, a lot of things like that cost a lot of money and need financing 
that can only happen through uh, the government level uh, because it's so vast. Um, and just the advisor role of the treasurer to uh, to work for the people because it's costing us a lot of money. Our climate change is costing us money. Not adapting our energy economy is costing us money. And the insurance crisis is costing us money. And all of these things relate to climate change and money. You mentioned Democrats don't take advantage of the economic message. <laughs> I think you're 100% right. We're better on the economy. Yes. You've also been talking a lot about trickle-down economics in your yes. social media. Tell me more. Okay, yes. So you're 100% right, Linda. We have ceded the economic lead or the perception uh, to the Republicans. We've just giving it to them. Um, you know, Democrats for the last hundred years have been the jobs party. We have been the party of economic growth and we have cleaned up messes that Republican leadership has made decade after decade. Uh, and the fact that we somehow many people think in Louisiana that the Republican leadership is the best with money is completely backwards. And we need to put it into it. Some people think that the word conservative means being good with money, you know, being thrifty with money. And I think that that's just kind of an accident in the words. And they kind of take advantage of that because nobody wants to be liberal with money. You know what I mean? So I think those words right there, even though they relate to social issues, gets put on economic issues and it hurts us. And we need to stand up again. I mean, all of the economic growth and changes that have happened over the last hundred years have been because of Democrats. And I think that's the way out of the state. You know, they they keep us on the defense, saying that we're against jobs and everything, when really that they are. And it comes down to trickle down economics. You know, that's that's the same story I've been seeing in my studies over the last couple decades and past depressions and recessions. You know, it all comes down to trickle down economics. And that is the only if you want to call it economic policy, that is the only policy that Republicans have ever stuck to for a long time. And for people that don't know what that is, it's essentially two things. One, cut taxes on the wealthy and big corporations at the top with the thought that, hey, if they have more money, that they'll all those benefits will eventually trickle down to the rest of us. They will create the jobs and everything that we have, and then we'll grow that way. But what it really leads to is budget cuts to public investment in people. And America as a, as a whole has on a public investment decline for, I would say, 60, 70 years. And we're starting to reverse that. And this is the same thing in Louisiana. We've had just constant budget cuts and in investments in people. And that means health, education, access, infrastructure, and opportunity have been steadily cut. And that's exactly what the Republicans want, because they just label it, well, government is the problem, you know, so it's cut that. But really, it means cutting you. When they say cutting government, that means cutting you and investments in you and your children. And what trickle-down economics leads to constant budget crunches. And then when it's time to raise revenue, when we do face a budget crunch, it leads to tax increases on the working class. You know, sales tax increases. The last budget crunch we had a couple years ago led to a half-cent uh, increase in sales taxes to fix the budget. And so you see what's happening. It means cutting at the top and then raising on everybody else and cutting investments in people. And, you know, those two things are, those are unpopular, Linda. Um, you add, you poll in everything, everywhere in the nation, you poll, do people want tax cuts at the top and cuts to education and health? And nobody wants that. But the Republicans get away with it by using the tools of divisive politics by using race mm -hmm. dog whistles, mm -hmm. uh, pitting white and black working class people against each other, distracted. And this strategy goes back, I mean, hundreds of years. It's tried and true. It always works. And that's the way they keep going with it. So that's what I mean earlier when I say these things are, are related. So that leads to more problems. It leads to a vicious cycle because when we have dr brain drain because of trickle down economics, what you see is the Republican leadership, like I won't name some of the governor candidates, saying, well, we got to cut more taxes. We got to get rid of the income tax. That'll be, that'll fix everything. We have to cut more taxes at the top to get people here. 
And as you see, it leads to more and more. You do that, that would lead to more budget cuts, to more brain drain. It's a never ending downward spiral. And we basically have to start reversing that. And what is tried and true is public investment in people, ending the giveaways at the top, making our tax code fair, you know, ending like ITEP and other things that just give away billions and start investing in people. And when you invest in people, the communities do better. Kids are able to go to college, even though they have tuition paid for, they're actually able to leave their house because their family isn't in poverty. You know, a lot of people can't go to college because they have to stay home and take care of their parents and work, you know, at a minimum wage job. And, you know, when you invest in people, they'll go to college, they'll stay in here, they'll innovate and uh, start businesses and rebuild their communities. And it blooms upwards. The value blooms upwards. And that attracts more outside business than anything. So we we create our own business. And that is what attracts outside businesses to the Louisiana because they see thriving communities and people that are taken care of. <laughs> I love talking about this, Linda. I love it. And that's so what much. we need to that's what we need to scream from the rooftops around the state. Like this is what's wrong. Their policy is taking money out of your pockets. We are the party of putting money in your pockets. Well, they've gotten away with branding Democrats as tax and spend liberals. Mm -hmm. And the problem is who they're talking about taxing when they say that is corporations and billionaires. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so they scare people into thinking that, you know, they're personal taxes are going to go up. But for the vast majority of us, that is not the case. Yeah. I mean, because I believe that we should have less taxes on working people. You know, we're, we're regressive. You know, uh, most of the people in the state pay more as a, a com compared to their income and their wealth than the people at the top two. We need to change that. We need to cut taxes on regular people and make them actually pay tax. Mm -hmm. um, and investment isn't spending. They love to label it spending, okay? Right. But public investment isn't spending. It doesn't go into a black hole. It actually creates more value because an economy is people. Your economy is not from, uh, you know, what's underground or, you know, oil and things like that. Economies are always built on people. So if you don't invest in people uh, and you don't uh, put the money where it needs to go, you're not going to get any money back from it and you're going to have a slumping economy. That's a really good point. And the other thing they like to say about this is that it's it's punishing success. So like if you do well enough to make money, they're punishing you by taxing you. But you know, first of all, they're really not talking about overtaxing people. Mm -hmm. They're just talking about reasonable people paying their fair share. Right. <laughs> Pay your fair share to make sure that this state works for all the residents of the state. Right. And and so many people at the because there comes a point with, all, you know, when you build up so much wealth, it almost accelerates so fast to where you don't do any work to make it accelerate. Mm -hmm, you know, so right. there's a certain point where wealth gets where success has nothing to do with it, because there's so many tax loopholes uh, with capital and everything that wealth can just accelerate into oblivion uh, with no hard earned work. So I'm not talking uh, about. Uh, raising taxes on small businesses. I'm talking about, um, you know, allowing us to tap those, you know, just complete giveaways on the top people at the top and the corporations at the top. Investing in communities to where our small businesses can thrive too, because when people have more money in their pocket, they will spend more in the small businesses. It never comes down from the top. All that money that we, all those giveaways we give, uh, to these multinational corporations, it usually just uh, either stays in a bank account or it gets shipped out of the state to shareholders. Right. right, right. Dustin, how's the campaign going? It's going great. We, uh, you know, it's got it's tough. Uh, you know, I'm I'm just happy that uh, qualifying has started and it's off to the races because you know the hardest part is just the call time and raising money, and that's been a struggle this year. I feel like uh, Democrats um, have uh, lost a lot of our fundraising base. It's not, you know, I, I'm i out there on the campaign trail 
you know, if you look at campaign finance reports of most of the Republicans, they're full of max out contributions from all kinds of LLCs and corporations and, and wealthy people. You know, there's not much of that that I have. So it's hard to keep up, but we've been sustaining on small donations. I think we have like a $200 average or something. And so we've, we're doing well and we're building the excitement. That's one thing that we have is to our advantage is we get people excited. So it's, I'm finally able to kind of get out why people are paying attention and get out and meet people and speak and try to build the energy to win this campaign. And I think we got a great shot. I'm the only Democrat on the ballot up against two Republicans. I would say that they're not really qualified for the job. And I think I have a real chance to get to a runoff and beat uh, one of my challengers. I think this is a very flippable seat. And hopefully, you know, we'll get some more fundraising dollars here in the home stretch. I'm confident in that. And what I'll say about donations for one of the things I repeat often is that the is that those donations matter because you've got the better message, you've got the mm-hmm. greater experience. But unless you can get that information to voters, unless you have yes. the money to let voters know those two points, it's very difficult for you to win an election. So that makes the point that folks should invest in these. Yeah, even even twenty fifty dollars is important. You know, if you like this message and you like other messages of Louisiana Democrats, please give what you can, because we we can get enough if we have a lot of people giving. You know, the Republicans don't really need any people giving because they get the money from the corporations uh, uh, in large amounts. But we we need you and we need we need uh, your invest investments, because just like Linda said, You know, we have a great message, but we need people to hear it. And it's not cheap uh, to get that message out into people's phones and on their TVs and uh, mailers and stuff like that. It can be very expensive uh, to do. So, yeah, that's that's one thing that I I hope we can get in there, win this thing. And hopefully we can turn that fundraising around and people see, oh, Democrats can actually still win in Louisiana. Look. Um, Mm -hmm. Dustin has won treasurer's office and hopefully that'll make people wake up a little bit and start investing in campaigns more. Well, the other piece about that is that if candidates see that they can get an investment of finances, they're more likely to run for these seats. Right. If if potential candidates, I should say. Yes, absolutely. And that's, that's the thing. And it's hard to do statewide. It's very hard to do. And I would encourage everybody. It doesn't cost as much to run for local school board and city councils. Uh, So if you're interested in politics, you know, most of the important stuff happens at those levels to get out there and try. You'll be surprised who will invest in you, you know, you you know, because people, there's people like us all over the state that will help you on on races and, you know, knock doors for you. A lot of that stuff that the money can't buy too on those races. Yeah. And I, and I think, Linda, that's one of the biggest problems that we have in America in politics is the way that campaigns are run and, and with money and stuff. Hopefully that'll change in the near future. But that's what we're stuck with. For now. Yeah. <laughs> Where have you been in the state? Who have you been talking to? Oh, man. <laughs> it's uh, I feel like uh, we're. You know, every time I talk to somebody, you know, I get uh, even more numbers. So I've been all over and. You know, being a Democrat, you know, of course, I'm hitting the biggest areas the most. You know, I'm in New Orleans, I feel like now once or twice a week, Baton Rouge a lot, go to Lafayette sometimes. Been going to Shreveport more lately and have a lot more going, a lot more on the calendar. Yeah, we hit a lot of different parishes. St. Mary Parish. Yeah, we went down to near Thibodeau, Bogalusa. Well, that was a while back. I got another one going there. Going, going up north again, you know, up north, they don't get a lot of exposure up north to candidates. So we have a lot of dates coming up where we're going, you know, to Monroe and a lot of the small communities up north of Oils Parish coming up. And man, I've just been meeting everybody. So many, that's one good thing to be optimistic about in Louisiana is we have so many great grassroots organizations that have really blossomed and, and, and gotten stronger in the last number of years. Uh, So just meeting with those organizers around the state, you know, saying that, you know, we got your back, you know, you know, spreading that word about those boots on the ground, I think gives us an advantage. So too many people to name. Yeah. So 
And I think you mentioned this earlier, but just to underscore, you're coming from Lake Charles, right? I'm from Lake Charles. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, being on this corner of the state, it doesn't make it easy. You know, I'm on the road a lot. Well, I'll get information from you or your campaign for our episode notes. So people will have a, a way to plug into what you're doing and connect with you in case they're interested in getting more involved or getting more information on the campaign. And I do know you're very busy, so I don't want to keep you too long. So <laughs> let's pivot to those last three questions I ask okay. at the end of every episode. Uh, Dustin, what's the biggest hurdle right now for Democrats in Louisiana? I would say the biggest hurdle is what I've noticed is um, I feel like Democrats uh, get in the trap from Republicans and playing defense too much. Um we, uh, we don't step up and be proud of a lot of our policies. Uh, and what we'll find is they're, they're very popular, even in Louisiana. You know, you look at all of our, almost all of our individual policies are very popular. But, but Republicans are really good at attacking us on them and making us kind of stay in a shell and pay defense. And I think that what we need to do is, uh, and I think what we're seeing, we're seeing a change in the, uh, in the Democratic Party in the South. Uh, we're starting to embrace a lot of our ideals and policies, especially with the younger generations. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, our state needs to adapt to that quicker than, you know, the days, you know, John Bell Edwards uh, election eight years ago could really be like 20 years ago because politics have changed so much in that mm -hmm. time. And mm -hmm. people are still stuck uh, in that mindset that only a Democrat like that can win. And I think that time has passed and we have some big advantages and, and, you know, we need to get past that. And I think with our party structure, too, I feel like we need uh, to build our infrastructure and our organizing infrastructure and uh, take real chances uh, instead of playing defense. We need to we need to go at the, the other party and play offense because they know we can win. They know our positions are popular, so they like it how it is. And what's our biggest opportunity? Biggest opportunity is the same thing. Like we have young people energized, more people invested or care about politics under the age of 45 or 40 than I've ever seen in my lifetime. And most of them are Democrats. They embrace our ideals. So I think we need to build on that. We need our younger people to start running for more campaigns and with offense, inspire people. You know, we in Louisiana, we have a progressive history, you know, we, we, you know, with Huey Long and Edwin Edwards, despite some of their, uh, you know, the corruption that was involved, a lot of things were corrupt back then. But the progressive ideals are kind of in our blood and history here. And let's not people remember that there's people that I talked to in their 80s, and they remember those days, you know, they grew up in those days. And a lot of a lot of our older, uh, I, I call them the silent generation, are very democratic too. Let's not look past them because they remember the days before the union busting of the 80s and Reaganomics and the shipping out of our manufacturing that a lot of Republicans have done. They have parents that lived through the depression. They remember those days and they will never vote for a Republican because of it. So I think we need to connect with them, the oldest and the younger generations uh, to rebuild and, and focus on organizing our people and lead with economics. Let's take that mantle back. And that's why this is a strategic seat for Democrats, because when I get in there, I'm going to call out the bad economic policy of Republicans at every moment I can. Fabulous. Dustin, who's your favorite superhero? You know, this is a, a, a yeah, I've always heard this question. I was huge into comic books whenever I was uh uh, you know, in junior high and stuff, I had, had a huge collection and I couldn't think of like who I still like, who I most aligned myself with back then because I love the variety of them. But now as an, I'm an adult, you know, I, I'm not real big into action movies, although I've watched some of the Marvel movies. But the one that I relate to the most, I, don't, I would say is, uh, and I don't know if he's really considered a superhero, is Loki. Um, there's a series on uh, Disney now and the character of uh, the Marvel uh, series. Um, and I like him because it's he's uh, somebody who was that arrogant kind of anti-hero bat, kind of a villain guy. And in this series, he's kind of put in his place. You know, he has his powers stripped from him uh, temporarily. 
and you know he's forced to to face like humility and it's funny because then his attitude changes and he becomes a superhero throughout uh and he's just funny and you know thinks he's got a big ego but put in his place and uh and becomes very empathetic and wanting to help uh people and and and, and be a superhero and i'd have to say that that one is what really uh touches my heart and really inspires me. I love that too. I, I love that story arc where, yes, you know, you can start off in one place and end up in a, in a totally different place where you do care about people and you're working for the greater good. And that sort of is what he's doing. Right. Dustin, thank you so much for taking some time off. I know you're so busy right now, but taking some time off of the campaign trail to speak to Louisiana lefty. I'm excited. I hope everybody listens to this. And hey, if you hear it, get out and support your local Democratic campaigns. You know, sign up on my website to volunteer. We need you and we can win. Thank you for listening to Louisiana Lefty. Please follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you to Ben Collinsworth for producing Louisiana Lefty. Jen Pack of Black Cat Studios for our super lefty artwork. And Thousand Dollar Car for allowing us to use their swamp pop classic security guard as our Louisiana lefty theme song.